today we've got a very special episode of the podcast. We are currently in Cambridge in the Gear Set headquarters, and I'm joined by a very exciting guest. Would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, everybody. Um, my name's David, um, David Rant, and I'm a software engineer here at Gearset. Um, I've worked in a kind of couple of various teams uh, since I joined Gearset. I've worked as a software engineer, as a DevOps engineer, um, and as a team lead as well. So I've worn multiple hats, and it was my two-year anniversary at Gearset yesterday. Wow, congratulations. Thanks very much. It's gone by very quickly. Time seems to compress when you work remotely. That's always a good thing. Well, David, thanks for um, joining us on the podcast today. Um, so we'll get straight into it. Talk to us about your journey um, into technology from the early years and how you ended up at Gearset. So I kind of came a bit of a convoluted route into technology. Um, I started out uh, at university. I studied medicine um, and kind of after a couple of years of doing that, I decided that a long running hobby of mine, which was computing, was kind of actually the the career path I wanted to go down. So um, after I uh, finished my undergrad degrees, I then went and did a master's degree in computer science um, at the University of East Anglia, um, which is where I'm from in Norwich and Norfolk. And um, uh, I started working for a, a small psychometrics company um, kind of in the area and that was that was great fun that was my first job um, and that was a real interesting place it was kind of a you could call it a startup even though it wasn't necessarily um, kind of the the term that was used at the time for small growing companies but it, it was a startup and um, we had a really interesting incentivization scheme when we were there so all of our work as software engineers was directly tied to uh, sales. So if sales went up, then salaries and bonuses went up. So it gave us a really good, honest measure and reminder that as software engineers, our primary, um, I guess our, our primary uh, focus is the business and not just the technology itself. Um, so it was a really honest steer for customers are our priority as software engineers and not just um, going down a rabbit hole of interesting um, bits of technology and things like that. Um, and then after that, I went and worked at a big Microsoft uh, unified communications company um, called Modality. Yep. Um, they were based in St. Albans, um, but their uh, software engineering offices were in Norwich. Um, and I went on to run a team there um, and we had a great time. Um, made friends for life there. Really, really fun bunch of guys. Um, and a couple of those guys now work at Gearset too. So that's really nice. Brilliant. Um, and from there, um, unknowingly uh, that Gearset was here, I went and worked next door on the Cambridge Science Park, which is where Gearset is based. Um, and I went and worked for a technology consultancy called Cambridge Consultants. Mm -hmm. um, that was a really interesting place. Really interesting place to work. Um, a whole bunch of... Um, interesting projects came through so working on um simulation systems for autonomous vehicles um semantic inferencing systems um delivering uh ultra fast broadband to planes over 5g carriers mm -hmm. lots of interesting stuff yeah uh and then uh, a friend of mine uh actually pointed gear set out to me um and i realized they were next door um dropped them an email, had a chat with uh, Luke, our head of engineering, really liked the sound of the way Gearset approached software engineering and how pragmatically we treated it as a as a kind of a discipline. Yeah. Um, and also the potential for growth in the company. So I took the leap and moved next door. And here I am. Brilliant. And what would you say your like, earliest memory is of like, the first time you realized you were interested in, in engineering software technology, what's the earliest memory you have of that? Um, I think for me, uh, it's a bit of an interesting one that I've, I've kind of followed my, my dad's career, but just in a very, um, accelerated time frame. So he started out as a microbiologist yeah. in the NHS. Um, and about halfway through his career, he ended up going to the Open University and studying for uh, a computer science degree. Yeah, different a different space back. Yeah, exactly. And so he was involved with kind of bringing a lot of automation into the way that 
um, microbiology as a discipline used computers and technology for like processing samples and things like that. Yeah. And I just remember how interesting his work was. And there was my dad trying to figure out a way of scaling that beyond it just being a people problem. Um, and I just remember all the kit he used to have. And like, I, I remember going to visit him at work and, um, that was back in, in, in the times when, um, hard drives were not just like a 2.5 inch caddy that you would put in a computer or even smaller now they were the, the, these huge great uh, machines that looked like uh top loading um spin dryers mm-hmm. the huge great cassettes that you would top load into these things and they'd hold like 256k of memory or something mm-hmm. like that um well, i just remember kind of being amazed by all this technology and it it just carried on from there like i ended up building pcs and doing a lot of hardware stuff when i was a kid um and a little bit of electronics too um and it just kind of stuck with me and when i got to the age of kind of 22 i just thought yeah i i'd quite like to see more of that um i kind of missed it so so off i went so dave uh what do you think gear set does differently uh in terms of technology that you use um slash like issues that you might face so I think one of the things that has always stood out to me at Gearset is how we choose the technologies that we use, yeah. um, how we work with our customers and how we make our own software engineers happy. So um, as a group of software engineers, our, our kind of our job is to map uh, business problems uh, onto technical solutions. Um, and that involves choosing technology. Um, and a lot of the time as engineers it's very seductive to kind of to locally optimize our technology choices what i mean by that is um you kind of are always as as a software engineer you always are reading blogs about the latest and greatest technologies and then you see a customer problem come along and you think hey i was only reading a, a blog post the other day about this new technology and it solved this customer problem perfectly but you can kind of end up in this position where you have a multitude of technologies, all which solve very small subsets of a of a greater set of problems. Yeah. And you can end up in this position where you get kind of this initial velocity boost from adopting these technologies and, and kind of solving each individual problem. But you start to accrue a lot of maintenance as a result of that. And that kind of maintenance of all of these different technologies in the long run can actually reduce how competitive you are as a company it reduces your ability to pivot because a lot more of your engineering time needs to go into maintaining updating and patching these technologies rather than focusing on solving customer problems Mm. so whenever we look at a customer problem at Gearset, the first question we we tend to ask ourselves is okay with the technologies we currently have can we solve this customer problem? Um, and even then, if there's if there's like a little bit of friction from the existing technologies we have, that friction is much cheaper than the long-term overhead of having to support a whole range of extra technologies for the sake of this one problem. So again, I think that comes back to the the level of pragmatism that I really admire about engineering at Gearset. Yeah, is that we're we're not just uh, technologists who are trying to chase the the latest and greatest shinies all of our software engineers feel that they are part of growing the business and as part of that it is making pragmatic decisions about how we can scale to the next 2000 3000 customers how we can scale our our engineering teams from 50 60 engineers over to you know 100 200 engineers in the next year or so mm-hmm. and and in regards to sort of tech trends um how do you how do you keep up with them? Is there like blogs, any YouTube and like what, what are your main sources to keep up with modern technology? So we all have um, a bunch of, of different ways of of researching and reading about the latest technology at Gearset. And actually what we do is we have a variety of stuff that, that feeds into the learning and development of our engineers. Yeah. So at kind of at the most basic level, we have um, dedicated Slack channels where we encourage all of our engineers to chat about stuff and, and bring ideas to the table. Um, 
that is just you know free form hey this is this is an interesting thing in case anybody else uh, might find it useful to read about and then kind of as a step up from that we have uh, learning and development budgets which every engineer has um, and you can pretty much spend in whichever way you like as long as it's you know relevant you can't yeah. go in and spend um, your LSE budget on a pottery course I know. Yeah. but um our engineers spend that on a variety of things, whether it's training, whether it is attending conferences, um, whether it's just getting licenses for tools that they want to want to try out and play around with. Um, you're kind of free to spend that how you see fit. Um, so a bunch of our engineers just went to NDC um, down in London the week before last, um, and uh, potentially some, some of our engineers might be interested in going to KubeCon in Amsterdam later this year. Um, but we also have people that signed up for, for kind of uh, courses on uh, getting real expertise and mastery in the tools that they use, whether it's kind of Postgres or React or Kubernetes or, or, or any kind of the, the tooling that we have that we make use of. Um, and then I guess at the, the kind of the top level of, of, of learning uh, for, for us as a company, every month we have what we call a drink and learn yeah uh, which is kind of a it's a casual um opportunity for members of the company not just software engineers to get up and speak about anything to the rest of the company and we make it a nice informal social occasion we we have drinks we have food um we all we sit in the room that we're sitting in at the minute um and we have sort of five or six pe speakers every month just these lightning talks and it's a great way of getting that cross-pollination between different teams in the company. So whether it's sales teams um, talking about uh, a, a new way of selling or a new way of talking to customers that they find is is working particularly well, um, or whether it's engineers talking about uh, some of the changes we've made that helps us uh, get our work out to customers um, more easily. Um, or even just ways of, of kind of talking to our customers and finding out what their problems are and, and, and whether they, there have been any particular ways of kind of engaging in those conversations that have been particularly fruitful. Or it can be stuff that, that is has nothing to do with Gearset at all. Um, we've had people um, kind of do talks about Cambridge and the local area. Um, one person in particular at Gearset gives a great talk every Christmas about certain historical aspects to... Uh, Christmas during the holiday seasons and stuff like that. Um, so it's it's a real varied and, and and nice reason to get together at the end of every month as well. Yeah, brilliant. Now we do a similar thing as well at Hacker Job, uh, but I think that information sort of exchange between different departments is 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 obviously good for the company and just knowing how other teams operate, what they do. It's just overall we're just going to improve the company. Um, yeah, cool culture and and, and understanding. Um, so. What is the what is the developer experience at Gearset like? If you had to sum it up, Dave. Um, so our engineering culture is kind of the foundation foundation of everything we do at Gearset. Um, we were a company that was started by engineers, and so the whole company tends to live and breathe a set of values that software engineers will find very familiar. And anybody who's read books like The Lean Startup and things like that. So they're very modern, contemporary values um, that we kind of, we live and breathe at Gearset. Um, strategically, we kind of focus on giving our engineers the most enjoyable and productive experience possible. Um, that involves giving them the best tools for the job. Um, so it was a real breath of fresh air when I started at Gearset and um, I was just asked what spec of kit did I want and how did I work and um, what was right for me not what did the company as standard give to you so that was that was a real breath of fresh air um, and fundamentally we we build DevOps tools for Salesforce engineers yeah and so we hold ourselves to the same standards that uh, we encourage our customers to work towards as well so um, we ship out to production um, at least twice a day. Um, we're always working to to ship to production even more as we grow. Um, we always make sure that we have tight feedback loops so we know when things are going wrong in production and we need to get a fix out for a customer. Um, 
or just finding data out about how a customer is using a new feature that we've shipped. Um, so giving our developers the tools to experiment and get very quick feedback on the work that they're doing directly from our customers is is probably one of the most um, important aspects about engineering at Gearset. Um, the main way our, our customers get in touch with us is through um, uh, our in-app chat. Yeah. But most of the time, um, when a customer tries to speak to us through that, um, it's a good chance that they'll end up speaking directly to an engineer. Um, and the reason for that is that um, our engineers... Our, our, pri our primary way of uh, measuring ourselves is the success of our customers. And so if we can be interacting with customers and directly understanding their pain points, rather than having to that information having to filter through lots of, of separate people, um, it just keeps that barrier between us and the people that we're trying to help really close. And it means that if we do ship something that um, is based on uh, a request or some feedback from a customer, we can immediately reach out to them through the in-app chat and say, hey, we've just deployed this, give it a go, see what you think, and, and let us know whether it whether it makes things better or not for you. And then we that gives us the ability to pivot very quickly, stay competitive, and really focus on the, the job that the customer is trying to achieve um, uh, and kind of just helping them out of that, that kind of pain point they have. Um, because that's why we're all here, just to help our customers. And so it makes that really, that relationship really transparent. Yeah, 100%. Like a super efficient way of doing things, having that direct contact with the client. But even from a non-technical standpoint, let's just say you've joined Gearset and you haven't had any sort of stakeholder experience or client-facing experience. Mm -hmm. I think that's really good taking sort of technical requirements and, and, and working on them straight away. Like that client side is um, not really, really good experience to have. Um, so you've touched on a few things, but what, what, uh, what are some of the projects that you're, you're currently working on, Dave? Um, I guess that's a busy place. There's a lot of stuff going on. Um, so I won't just talk about the things that I'm kind of touching on. Um, I'll, I'll talk about what, what car, our current kind of strategy is a, as an engineering team yep. and the kind of things we're, we're trying to solve. So if we talk about growth of engineering at Gearset. Um, we've set ourselves up really well to grow to the size that we are now. Um, and we want to double our headcount in engineering this year. Um, and so one of the things that, that we need to constantly be aware of, uh, is looking back at the processes and the tools, uh, and the approaches that we currently have and making sure that they will scale to, uh, an engineering team that is double, triple the size that we currently have. So there's some really interesting work going on around how we um, deploy uh, our solution out to customers, yep. um, helping us to get changes into the hands of customers even quicker than we do now, um, and uh, being able to grow our software engineering team without kind of increasing um, uh, the the risk that, that we ship bugs and things like that. Yeah. Um, so obviously with more software engineers, we've got more changes going out in every release. Um, and so we want to make sure that even though we are shipping more stuff to customers even more frequently, we don't start to um, see us compromise on the quality that we deliver to our customers. Yeah. Um, so there's a whole bunch of really interesting work going on there. Um, we have quite a big customer base in the US. Um, one of the big projects that uh, is being looked at this year is HIPAA compliance. Um, and regulation like HIPAA is a meaty project to tackle. The first part of our process of tackling HIPAA is to review the documentation and the requirements and see where we currently stand against that and see where we need to make those changes. But it's a tricky one with something like uh, regulations like that because you can uh, either be a bit too uh, flippant with your interpretation of what the, the rules and regs are, yep. or you can kind of go to the nth degree where um, you you put too much process in place so that you no longer um, you put too much process in place that it starts to erode your velocity as a company yeah um, and I think anybody who's worked with regulatory frameworks can understand there's very much a sweet spot of um, uh, meeting those framework requirements 
um but it's always very tempting to go too far and you kind of end up in this uh situation where you can't move because of the the number of processes you put in place yeah so um it's a really interesting one again going back to how gear set is pragmatic how we can meet those HIPAA requirements confidently for our customers but in kind of a, a very gear set fashion of being pragmatic about how we approach that so that's really refreshing for me too having been through some painful requirements programs at previous places in the past um and then I guess the big push for us as a company this year um, is to really focus on how we can support our bigger customers. Gearset has always been a, a primary choice for uh, engineering teams of kind of uh, up to 10 or 20 Salesforce engineers. Yeah. Um, and we know that we can grow our, um, our market share by looking at those bigger um, software engineering teams, those bigger Salesforce software engineering teams. And so our focus for a lot of our software teams this year is to really try and engage with those customers um, and understand what are the pain points that th those engineering teams have at larger enterprise companies compared to um, kind of smaller implementation partners and things like that. Um, so we're doing a whole bunch of work that tends to fall into kind of audit and compliance and regulatory stuff too. So providing uh, more sign-in options for our enterprise customers who might want to bring their own authentication methods to Gearset rather than relying on, say, G Suite or Salesforce authentication. Um, or it may be that we need to bring in additional security controls based on kind of what members of team of the team are allowed to uh, do what kind of acti different kind of activities in Gearset. So in regards to, to Gearset's engineering teams, um, how are they structured and are there like any any blockers involved? Our engineering teams are loosely structured around uh, a book called Team Topologies. We haven't consciously modeled ourselves on it, but it's an analogy that kind of works in my mind. Um, so we have uh, a whole number of stream aligned teams that are focused on the customer facing aspects of our system. Um, th they tend to be aligned to, to different verticals in the Salesforce ecosystem. Um, and we also have a few uh, teams that are focused on kind of customer churn and resolving kind of uh, any issues that, that we have seen correlate to churn events with our customers. Yeah. Um, and a growth team, which is all about giving our customers the best onboarding experience with Gearset and things like that. Um, in addition to those streamlined teams, we, we have two uh, platform teams as well. Yeah. So we have um, an internal applications team. Uh, they work on um, software that helps gear set move quickly so software that supports our sales process our marketing processes um all of the other departments in gear set and then we have a devops team um as well who focus on helping our stream aligned teams stay um stay focused on solving our customers issues um and there are there are a bunch of guys from various backgrounds whether it's kind of a software background or more of an operations background yeah um and they're the guys that we go to when we have some uh, gnarly networking or operations issues that our software teams may not have the expertise on on figuring out and need a kind of a, a, a bit more contextual information on how they could go resolve those problems. You've mentioned a few, but what's the main technology stack that you're working with at Gearset? And when you join the company, is there any technologies or programming languages that you had to learn? So way back in the day, gear set started out as a desktop tool um it was the quickest way at the time for us to get stuff to customers um in a low effort way it meant that we could quickly iterate and ship changes to our customers um when we didn't have the scale to run the big distributed systems that we do now yeah um today though um our primary tools include uh in terms of programming languages we focus on um, C Sharp um, and, and .NET as the whole stack. Um, and we use uh, TypeScript on our front end. Yep. Um, we deploy everything into Kubernetes clusters. And we're heavy users of AWS. And we're also uh, very heavy users of Postgres as well um, for all of our data storage. Um, and it's a really pragmatic stack um, that means we can kind of 
solve any customer problem that presents itself to us, mainly with that core of technologies. And there'll be some extra customer problems where we might need to bring in an extra tool here or there. But for 90% of the problems we see and the, the kind of the challenges we have, um, that core technology stack takes us takes us all the way. Mm -hmm. And did you come from like a, a .NET background or? Yeah, I've sort of, I've, I've varied a bit um, over my career. Um, I, I've always enjoyed learning new languages and, and kind of the pros and cons that different languages kind of have inherently with the way they've been written. Um, but .NET always tends to be the one that I come back to. And it, it it's just because I've always found the, the developer experience with .NET to be better than um, most other languages I've used. Um, Microsoft, for all of the, the good and bad that opinions that people might have of them, I think are very good at getting a good developer experience with their tooling. Mm -hmm. um, and, and .NET has always had very good developer tooling. Brilliant. Um, so for a lot of engineers, making an impact is important. How does Gearset's engineering team do this? And what is your development uh, development life cycle like? Um, so as an engineering culture at Gearset, we fundamentally believe that our job satisfaction comes from solving deep problems, yeah. not just from learning new technologies. Um, so many engineers will have worked at places where you have to struggle to deliver values, deliver value to your customers because technology and the, the, the variety of technology can just get in the way a little bit. Yeah. Um, whether that's having to get up to speed with, um, another way of doing something or maybe having to get up to speed with uh, another tool chain that, that you're not familiar with. Maybe another team uh, ship stuff with a complete different uh, a tool chain. Um, but at Gearset, we like to make consistent choices so our engineers can kind can, in theory, our engineers can go and solve customer problems regardless of which part of gear set they need to work in so everything in gear set to our software engineers will be familiar and they'll be able to get up to speed quickly and um, that's important to us as a company because it means that we can pivot and we can help our customers regardless of kind of the problems they come to us with but it also means that if we need to um spend some particular focus on certain areas uh, of the application then we, we can easily get more eyes on that stuff without having that initial ramp up cost as well. Mm -hmm. um, adaptable, very adaptable. Yeah, exactly. Um, and I think an important part of making an impact as well as an engineer at Gearset is not just being able to pick up any part of the, the application and run with it, but it's also being able to measure the impact that you're having on customers. So... Uh, we spend uh, a lot of time making sure that the tooling that we use to uh, get insight about how our customers use Gearset and how, how Gearset is performing for them, we spend a lot of time kind of making sure that that tooling is um, as, good, as good as we can get it for our software engineers. Um, so we make use of um, a variety of different tools for kind of logging and, and metrics and, and tracing and things like that. And with all of these tools, it means that our engineers can visibly see the impact they're having on our customers. Yeah. So, uh, say uh, a customer is um, uh, saying that they need they need certain processes to to run a bit quicker and stuff like that, and we identify that there's a couple of optimizations we can make. Um, as an engineer, you can just go and see the impact that you've had and how how much you're helping that customer. Just with just by surfacing that data and making it open to to everybody as well. It must be like I said, very rewarding uh, to see that impact in real time and having that feedback from the customer. Yeah. And having all of your peers essentially see that feedback as well. I think that's a yeah, absolutely. Um, and we we intentionally keep that gap between our engineers and our customers very small, so um, our engineers can quickly iterate on an idea, get it out to a customer. Um, to the extent where it's not uncommon where a customer will get in touch we will identify an improvement or a fix for them 
and we'll get it shipped the same day. Um, so uh, not just a 24-hour turnaround to acknowledge a ticket, it's a 24-hour or less turnaround to acknowledge and fix and get it back in their hands for some feedback. Um, and, and, and it's not just our customers, it can be um, you know, our partners at Salesforce or, or other people that make a suggestion, we think it's a great idea and we just get it done. Um, and it's a really refreshing aspect of engineering at gear set. Yeah, no, it sounds, sounds brilliant. Um, obviously we, we, we touched on, um, tech trends, um, earlier. Um, is there any, any trends or technologies or processes that you're sort of itching to implement at gear set at the moment, or you've already started implementing at gear set? So I guess one of the things that has particularly caught my eye and proved its usefulness already at Gearset is um, changing the way in which we gather all of our observability data. So I mentioned before that that we we gather information on logs and metrics and traces, and we've kind of done that over a variety of protocols in the past um, in a variety of shapes and formats and specs and, and all that kind of thing. Uh, but the industry has really started to settle around one common standard for all of that stuff called open open telemetry. Um, and we've started to make a conscious move towards that. So we're now able to um, adopt um, some best of breed tooling that supports open telemetry. Um, and we're all see, already seeing very fruitful benefits of that uh, in giving our engineers insight into how customers are experiencing Gearset as an application. So that's been a very that's been a very impactful change um, that has been also been a very sensible one for us, um, and we can see the the value that it's adding to our customers already by being able to preempt preemptively uh, see issues or dive deeper into issues that we may not have been able to before. Um, so that that's a really great one. Um, we kind of at Gearset we we all are very interested in the latest tools or technologies um, or approaches that are coming along. Um, but we tend to, we always try and look at latest trends and opportunities through that pragmatic lens yeah. of will it help our customers? We're growing quickly. Is it worth investing our time in adopting this technology? And if the answer is yes, we commit to it and we go for it. Mm -hmm. um, but you can spend a lot of time chasing your tail with new technologies, especially if you don't know operationally what those technologies are like to run with. So um, it's very nice that Gearset is made up of a large number of very proven technologies and consistent technologies because it means for us as engineers we can spend our time thinking about more valuable stuff than uh, trying to debug operational issues that we might be seeing because we've adopted some piece of tooling that isn't very well supported yet or something like that. So um, it's nice to be able to, it's nice to have the freedom to focus on our customers' problems rather than um, churning on uh, technology choices that we've made. Internal problems as well, yeah. Yeah. Um, so just from a, a personal standpoint, mm -hmm. is there anything that you're super interested in in the world of tech at the moment so like web3 ai machine learning like is there anything that you're super interested in so for me the 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 area that i'm interested in is um the use of uh game engines as physics simulators and that's particularly becoming relevant with um autonomous vehicles and for driver assisted um decision systems to be able to make decisions uh, for drivers you have to um rack up a large number of miles to validate those decision models yeah and in reality it's not practical to do that on real roads and so the only way to do it is through simulation um and so it's very very interesting to me um, the way that game engines are filling that gap very quickly. Unity um, is is having huge adoption in that space and you can see Unity have actually kind of pivoted the way they market themselves to not just a game engine but as a 
kind of a more general purpose physics um, simulation engine now as well. Um, and the other thing that I'm particularly interested in as well is is IoT. Mm -hmm. IoT in the news has taken a bit of a backseat in turn in comparison to Web three and AI yeah. recently, but IoT and Industry four point are going to revolutionize the way we do manufacturing, the way we gather data, and there's still a lot of um, there's a lot of interesting problems to be solved, particularly around device lifecycle management. So it's very easy to 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 build a device, but then how do you manage your fleet at scale? How do you reliably get that data back from those endpoints to some distributed backend system for processing? Um, and there are patterns and practices that have kind of become commonplace, but it's still constantly evolving. Um, and one of the reasons I'm particularly interested in IoT is, um, and again, this goes back to Gearset being a really great place for learning and development. Yeah. Um, I actually only work four days a week, and one day a week I study um, embedded electronics. Oh, brilliant. Um, so IoT kind of naturally fits in with that for me, um, and and kind of going further down the stack to, to closer to bare metal and embedded devices just uh, I find very interesting and and quite rewarding so yeah IOT uh, for me is 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 one of the the main areas of interest I'm still keen to see how web 3 and AI settles down and starts to make inroads into our industry mm -hmm. um, but for me yeah those things are, are particularly like the things I'm interested in at the minute and I guess that goes sort of full circle to your to your dad's career working on the hardware side of things. It's sort of part of the pond, but embedded in you, I guess. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Cool. So from a from a recruitment sort of standpoint, um, what types of roles uh, are currently on offer at Gearset, and how would they help your team, the wider company, and the overall mission? I think the easiest way of putting it is that we can't grow quickly enough at Gearset. We just need more people. Um, and we're always on the lookout for for people to join the company. Um, in engineering in particular, we're hiring for um, engineers of all experience levels from grads through to principal engineers. Um, and all of the rest of our departments are hiring too. Um, I couldn't list all of the, the roles that we're looking for off the top of my head. But yes, we're growing as, as, as pragmatically quickly as we can. Um, the market in which we find ourselves is a growing market and it's it's a long way to saturation yeah um so if anybody wants to to join a company that has a very very bright future um go to gearset.com slash careers and take a look through and what advice would you give to someone who's looking to apply at gearset i mean what what would you if someone was applying for a role in your team like what sort of skills soft skills tech skills what would you ideally be looking for i think the first thing i'd encourage them to do is to go and look at our company values and our engineering values that we publish on our website um and if you think those values sound like a bit of you then send in an application um for engineers we really want to see people that have got a great technical foundation but are hiring process is focused around aptitude and not languages and uh, frameworks um, we really want people who are able to help our customers with technical problems and solve those using software and infrastructure and, and operational practices um, and all of those things will change as time goes by. So if we hire for languages and frameworks, we we wouldn't be doing ourselves a favor. Yeah. So we really want people that have a good technical grounding and a good technical mind for solving problems. Um, we love to see evidence of engineers who have proactively been involved with the business outside of just writing code as well. Okay. So whether that's you know speaking to stakeholders and understanding what their requirements are, whether it's helping like solve customer problems um whether it's identifying uh, opportunities to improve processes or practices we love to read about all of that stuff um it's very easy to fall into the trap of 
um, CVs becoming almost a wish list of, of languages and technologies. Um, and if we see CVs that come in from engineers that talk about how they've delivered value to the company that they worked for outside of kind of the day job of writing code, those are the CVs that really stand out to us because we have a, there's a very high correlation that those those engineers will be very successful at Gearset and help us deliver value to our customers. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Well, Dave, I think that's all the time we have for today, but I just want to say thank you so much for having us here today uh, at, at Gearset HQ. Thanks for sharing insight into your career and what life's like as an engineer at Gearset. Um, before we leave today's uh, podcast, is there anything you'd like to say, anything you'd like to, to plug before we finish? I'd like to say thanks to Gearset for giving us the opportunity to get involved with podcasting and um, conference speaking. Um, these are all opportunities that don't come up that often at a lot of uh, employers and a lot of jobs. So it's great to be able to step out of the comfort zone and embrace a bit of discomfort and be involved with stuff like this. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Dave. Thank you.